Well, hey there, my friend. Welcome back to the Creative Shop Talk podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Batten. And today, we have a special guest. We have somebody in the studio. (laughs) I say in the studio, we're on Zoom together. And I'm really excited to have this conversation because marketing is the topic today and marketing is such a broad and big thing and it's a conversation I have with so many of my retailer clients and my shop owners. We have a lot of hats to wear and marketing I think is one of the biggies, right? If we're not marketing and we don't have people and we're not doing it right and we're not representing our brand, then there's nobody in the shop to buy from us, right? So I'm really excited today. I invited my friend Leanne Presley on. She is the CEO and founder of a business called Stitchcraft Marketing, which is a digital marketing agency. Um, She primarily specializes in helping fiber and fabric companies with their social media strategy and execution, but all of the marketing pieces. And again, she works with a lot of small independent retailers. So we have a great conversation for you today. I really enjoyed chatting with Leanne and also when I when I say chatting with her but like the questions like I think we could have talked forever. <laughs> I feel like we could have chatted forever because it's such a big topic. She's going to pull out and share nuggets about how to be more efficient with your social media and with your marketing in general. We're going to talk about a little bit about ChatGPT and what does that look like for the independent retailer. We're going to talk about how we can hand off our brand and our message to companies like hers and to other companies and how do we delegate our voice how do we delegate and share and give away you know give other people autonomy to to do our marketing and and social media for us and how do we how do we do that what are the steps involved we also talk a little bit about how to be really thoughtful about aligning our brand and what I mean by that, by aligning our brand, but how do we stay true to our brand and talk to our customers? And how do we just have an easier time with our social media? My goodness, guys, we all agree, right? It's it's, it's a big chunk. I truly believe that it is our job and our responsibility as one of the main gigs that we have to do is be a marketer first. Again, if we don't have marketing, we don't have people. If people don't know we exist, if there's no visibility, no awareness, no nurturing, no, you know, serving, then there's no business. We can have the best business in the world. We can sell the best things inside the doors. We can have the best customer service. But if people don't know we exist and people don't come in, then that doesn't matter, right? So our conversation today with Leanne is all about how do we stretch those marketing muscles and how do we make it a little bit easier so hang on grab your pen if you can put put your earbuds in walk a little faster (laughs) whatever you're doing today as you're listening all right let's jump in and listen to leanne presley and see what she has to say for us today Running a retail business doesn't have to be so hard. Welcome to the Creative Shop Talk podcast, the go-to podcast for creative shop owners, studio owners, and independent retailers. I'm your host, Wendy Batten, retail business coach and mentor. Each week, I'll share simple, proven business strategies, inspiring stories from fellow retailers, and advice from industry experts. Together, we're going to work to find the success you want from your retail business with more profits in your till and a little more joy in your life. I have such a treat for you today. Leanne, welcome to the Creative Shop Talk podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me, Wendy. I'm excited. I am so excited. I invited you here today because the missing link to so many of what my retailers are looking for are what you provide and what you can share with us today. So we have lots of questions and lots of things. Tell us a little bit about your business and what you do. Who, who, Who do you serve and what do you do? Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So I am the founder and CEO of Stitchcraft Marketing. 
We are a niche marketing agency founded in 2009, and we specialize in just crafts. I started in the fiber sector, and then last year we had a really big boom in the fabric sector. And then we're hoping in the future, we're going to branch into what I call hard crafts, some more painting, ceramics, those kinds of crafts. Um, but we're super niche. That's all we work with is folks in the craft space. And then within that niche, we've got even another little niche, which is a specialization in strategy and execution of social media programs. So for most of our clients, they come to us and say, I know I need to do social media, but either A, I hate it. I don't want to do it. I'd rather someone else do it, or I'm just not doing it right. I, I know that there's more to it and I just am not grasping best practices. So we'll come in uh, after doing a whole evaluation of their business and we kind of take a look at where the low hanging fruit is. We'll propose a whole customized program for them. We take everything off their plate. Um, and it's a wonderful thing because now, you know, as creative people, we've got a ton of things to do and we really need to be spending our time on the creative pieces of our business that no one else can do for us. Those little bits and parts you cannot outsource. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, and then I usually tell clients, you know, we are a full service agency. So we provide web dev, web dev services. We'll redo a website for you. We do SEO. Uh, we'll do, we've got a couple little unique programs. We do an influencer marketing program. We do a designer support program, lots of little bits and pieces. And that's all on our website, stitchcraftmarketing.com. That's, that's fantastic. So I, I also think that it's really important. So you do e-commerce, like you do a lot of uh, Etsy e-commerce, anybody in the business, but you have yep. brick and mortars as well. So of course, yep. um, obviously you the, the, the information, I guess I want people to keep listening, even if you're not a creative, because I think there's a lot of great things that Leanne's doing that can be supportive to anybody running a vision or passion driven right. business. And we all have those same time limitations the love for social media. I say that with my eyes rolling because not, yes. <laughs> I actually don't know very many people who say I love that, but, and I know it's marketing. To, I, I preach this, teach this. I shouldn't say preach. I teach marketing yep. isn't just social media, but it's such right. a, you know, and I know like that's what you're talking about all the things you do. How did you end up doing this for a living? Like, how did you get where you are? Mm. Well, I won't bore you with the long, long, long story. Let's just try to do the short and sweet of it. Uh, so I was working in a restaurant. My husband and I started a restaurant because we were absolutely insane. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was uh, doing web dev on the side and I traded some coaching services, nod to all of you coaches out there, uh, with somebody that needed a new website. And she said, oh, I'll trade you some coaching sessions for some web dev. So I came after a couple of sessions to realize I really wanted to work in my passion, mm -hmm. which was knitting. And I had had some connections with some folks up in Fort Collins. I live in Colorado uh, to interweave press. And I just pestered the heck out of them till they gave me a job. Uh, started there, uh, worked there for a few years selling advertising for print magazines, predominantly in the fiber space. And then the recession hit in 2008. And I found myself on the phone for hours on end talking to people about what's this social media stuff? How do I post on this Facebook stuff? Oh, by the way, I don't want to buy a print ad from you, but can you give me all this other free advice? Uh, and I knew a lot about that and uh, just kind of came to the realization I needed to jump ship from the print sales and move over into more of a digital marketing space. Worked with a few clients that had been my print customers for years. And then a couple of years later, just kind of woke up and went, oh my gosh, I think I have an agency <laughs> uh, and then spent the last 14 really just trying to refine that into what it is today. It's, it's always interesting. There's never a straight line. I, I have No yet, straight lines. Yeah. No, there's, and it's funny because I worked in, I, I owned a coffee shop or cafe for you. For oh, there you go. <laughs> with the same reaction you had about, I don't know what we were thinking, but, uh -huh. <laughs> so, but it is interesting because like becoming what we are now, like there's, there's always, I always love knowing sort of how did you get where you are? Because yeah. it, we're bringing all these different experiences. So it's never a straight line. It's a little bumpy sometimes. And yeah. uh, uh, it also, it's real life experience, right? So you are seeing and working with real, mm -hmm. you know, being in the, in the trenches, I guess, too. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm finding with retailers and brick and mortar in creative and all of the industries that I work with, it's just so much time. <laughs> so yeah. I, I see a lot of people wanting to, you know, hire an agency or at some point hire an agency and they don't even know what does that mean? What does it mean to hire an agency? Like what, mm. 
like what what's involved with hiring some hiring that out because I think it's really fearful of how we how do we do that and you know mm-hmm. what's involved and what are, like how would we go about thinking about that if not mm-hmm. now at some point yeah I get this question a lot I think some of the fear comes from a place of really good business owners know that they have to have a unique voice and a tone to their brand and their business. It's one of the things that differentiates them from everyone else selling the same widgets, if you will. So we get that question a lot. How do I work with an agency, but still retain our voice and who we are? And my answer to that is always, uh, we, well, that's part of the talent. That's what we do is bring to the table, our unique skill and being able to replicate your voice and your brand and your messaging. So we always start with a big evaluation we call it a strategic analysis. So we'll come into, let's just use you for an example, Wendy, I come into your business and I look at all the different moving parts that relate to social media. So I look at your website from a user experience, look at all of your channels, the type of posting that you're doing, the frequency that you're doing, what channels you've selected. We look at your newsletter, we look at your blogs, we look at your competitors, and we wrap all of that into this report that we present to you. And we say, all right, Wendy, here's what we're seeing. You really are falling behind with short form video, your competitors are crushing it with short form video, and you're not doing any of that. Or your blogs are good, but they're a little too pushy, a little too much sell, sell, sell. We need to refine those. So it's more storytelling. It's more about your vision and who you are. Uh, So we'll go through all those moving parts, make our recommendations for where we think that low hanging fruit is. And then we'll come in with a customized program for you. I'll say, if you want to onboard with our agency, You can start with our basic package, a mid-range, or an advanced package. And when I say package, it's all customized. It's not like we take it off the shelf and say, here's the gold package for you, Wendy. It's all customized. So that's just what we see would be the best place to start with you. And it's aligned with what your budget is. And normally clients will say, oh, great. I want to start here. This looks like uh, what's going to be easiest for me. And then they roll into a retainer program with us. And it's the same services every month. Uh, And when I say it's the same services, that doesn't mean it's not dynamic. We, of course, make tweaks and changes where we see we need to. uh, But that's kind of the onboarding process and how you would move from doing everything yourself into working with an agency. And I always like to say that brand voice, it's so critical. It's so important. And it usually takes about three months or so the three to six month mark is where the clients really see that sweet spot. And they're like, okay, these guys get it. Stitchcraft knows what they're doing. Now I can turn my focus to all the other things in my business that I need to do. Um, you'd have an account manager, someone in the trenches with you. That's your touch point. Uh, so if anything comes up during the course of working together, that's who you work with to, to make changes. And they're the person overseeing everything happening with your program. I think that's, uh, so well explained. And I, and I asked that because so many retailers, I mean, a, that's what you do. So many yep. retailers right now, I feel like they've tried or they've dabbled in trying to find, I, you know, I, I just, I can think of, you know, seven or eight of my clients right now mm. who are like, mm. I like to outsource this. I don't know how. And so thank okay. you for sort of explaining that in the process. Yeah. So um, yeah. and what to expect when you do it, because you do want to keep your own voice. You do want to, mm-hmm. you do want to make your best choices as well too. Right. What, what right now are you seeing? Is there a right answer to switch social media or what pieces we should be looking at right now to get the word out? Because there's so many opportunities now, so many options, so many things. Like, mm-hmm. what is the best way for those of us right now who are doing it ourselves right now mm-hmm. or that you're seeing that are, are working? Or is it just? Well, I've got, I've got kind of two parts to that answer. One is, I always start off with clients that come to me with that question and say, I'm going to first just give you permission that you don't have to do everything. You don't have to be perfect at it. Uh, If you're trying to juggle four or five different social channels and you're doing them all very poorly, cut it back. Just pick the one or two or even one that you are most familiar with, you're most comfortable with. I'm giving you permission. If it's just Instagram, just do Instagram and do it really, really well. So that's one thing I'll say. Um, The second part of that question is the social media landscape is changing so fast Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And what works well a month ago is not, could maybe not work well next month. So 
my overall advice is you got to be in the game. You've got to be doing regular posting. You've got to be on the channels. You've got to be engaging with your audience. All of those basic practices never change. As far as what's hot right now, uh, you know, we're recording this in May of 2023. And I will say where, where I'm seeing success with my clients is a couple of different places. One short form video for sure. Uh, and it, it, it's like one to three minute videos, uh, where you're in front of your audience, you're making that connection with your consumer and you're putting yourself out there in the most authentic way that you can. That content ends up on reels, uh, could be TikTok. You know, it really depends on who your customer avatar is, but getting out there and doing some form of video, it could be live video, it could go up on YouTube. It could be static images that you're converting into a video format. Because uh, I, I get a lot of that pushback. People are like, oh my gosh, I'm not going in front of a camera. That No way, that's where I draw the line. And again, I give you permission, take your static images that are beautiful and professionally shot, or maybe not professionally shot and convert those using something like Capwing or Canva, turn it into something dynamic. So short form video is really where it's at right now. The algorithms are favoring that all the time. Um, the other thing we're keeping our, uh, an eye on right now is on Facebook, uh, how they're really moving away from groups and business pages into organic posting that comes from individuals that are configured as professional mode. So it's brand new, uh, really starting to see this come through on the algorithms. And a lot of your listeners probably are going to go, what the heck is that? <laughs> um, but professional mode really bestows uh, on a personal profile, some extra bells and whistles. Uh, it allows them to generate different insights from their audience. Uh, there's just some sort of different rules when it comes to engagement and ads and monetization uh, availability. So if you haven't heard of professional mode, that would be kind of the next hot thing to take a look at. You'd have to convert your personal profile to professional mode. Uh, but the clients that we're working with that are starting to do that, we're, we're seeing some really nice growth and engagement. And maybe, you know, Wendy, in the last couple of months, I'm getting lots of complaints and maybe you are too from your retailers that engagement has just been sluggish. Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, I'm posting all the time and for what? I'm not getting anything. Uh, so this is one area, especially on Facebook, where we are seeing a little bit of movement. So that's on a business profile. It's a personal that. profile converted to professional mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that means someone the either- from that than the business or my business- <laughs> Our, our business, business page. Profile. Uh -huh. our business yeah. Page. So profile. There, I, I think this comes from a place of Facebook and other social channels starting to see the value of individuals as marketers and influencers and content creators. Uh, people want to engage with people and not necessarily brands anymore. There's just more trust that happens from one-on-one -on -one between individuals. And so Facebook and other channels are starting to see that shift. And so this is a way for them to sort of empower and validate what they're seeing in the real world. And this professional mode is a way to kind of overlay your personal profile uh, and give you that megaphone, if you will, to speak as an individual. Um, but kind of through the lens of a brand. So again, uh, brand pages, they're not going away. I think you still need one, but if you've got limited time and energy to invest in your social, you might take a look at this professional mode. Yeah, I love that. So I will say on a personal note from my personal page, <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, I know all the rules or not. I don't sell on my business, on my personal page. Yep. Yeah. But that's where people like want to hang. Like, like I post that's where people want to friend me and be hanging out because I'm kind of sure. that girl anyways. Like yeah. I don't very much yeah. overshare on social media. Yeah. Everybody knows that. But, you know, it's just because I'm offending, I guess, maybe. And that's always been the case. And it's really interesting. That is right. so true. It's because people want to do business with Wendy, not some agency as, yeah. a, rule, as a rule. So yeah. that's really interesting. And, and, and you are your brand. You yeah. are your, your name and who you are as an individual. That is your brand. There's more of a leap if you think about companies yeah. like, you know, a big, let's say paint company, for example, that, you know, it, it gets muddied. Who is the face of that brand? And so to have someone within the company that is willing to be the face of the brand might see a little bit more traction. Yeah, it is an interesting, it is an interesting thought. And I, I it's funny because as you're saying that, I'm thinking like a lot of my retailers are their brand, and I and I will say if I step back a little bit, um, and some of my listeners might know the story, and some don't. But 
when I had my store, I was my store. I was the face of my store. And yeah. like, you know, and I remember somebody saying, and that's what also what was happening. My personal page was like, I had a business page, but my personal page was just nurturing people like crazy. And I naturally, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I was just doing that, but I was just sharing everything from the store over there. And it was really fun. And I, you know, my, my people is what I kept saying. And I never thought I would, I thought I would always own and be part of that. I would always be that store. Like mm. oh, that's just Wendy, yeah. Wendy's baby. It's Wendy's yeah. store, right? I was, yeah. paint, I was paint, furniture painting and all that kind of stuff, but I did franchise my business. Mm-hmm. Like I like, jumped ahead. And so I didn't want to be the face of, so there is some thought process around that. Do you want to be yeah. just the face of your business? Because when I franchised and then eventually sold that arm mm-hmm. of it, um, that wasn't me anymore. <laughs> It's right. really hard for my franchise. Like my yeah. best friend bought my franchise and it was like, okay. So like, so it is hard to step away. So inter- that's a really interesting mm-hmm. thing to think about and pull mm-hmm. through. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, like, really. And I'll just say one yeah. other th- thing yeah. about that, you know, to your point about selling, we're, we're all advising clients a lot too, that are interested in selling. You don't want to be the face of the brand oh, so yeah. much so that yeah. now you've compromised your ability to sell the brand and the company. So it's just, it's a delicate balance, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I just see this yeah. trend. Facebook's following where the algorithm, where the people are going. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting and really food for thought. And I too say the same thing. We don't always, you know, never say never. I would, I would have, I would have bet a lot of money that I would never sell my business. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So never, so you don't know what the future holds. You don't know what, I, so I do the same thing, but we do need to build relationships. I also think Mm. as brick and mortar independents right now, we do have that ability to beat the big box with that. We have that, we can be connect, we can connect and whether it's on that personal Facebook page or whether it's on your Instagram or wherever it is, that is our competitive advantage in my opinion, is that we can show and share and do and you know like you said where you know those selfies are not selfies but those you know short form videos that's, you know, I really think that I I'm with you on that. I think that it's a way to connect and mm. people see the human behind the stores and the, in the shops. Yeah. So there's a, yeah. there's, they can't do that at Walmart. Right. Like they just yeah. can't do that. They can, uh, they're trying to, it's really funny because uh, I sit on a lot of boards of uh, retail boards and it's interesting. It's always the big guys there. Like it's mm. like, and me anyway, <laughs> it's like they don't, there's no, I feel like there's a really big missing cap of representation yeah. of small independence, but yeah, right. That's, not, that's another podcast for another day. But yeah. I sit, you know, I sit in these meetings and board, whatever, and conferences and, you know, they're all, time, how can we connect more and nurture, you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, like, so, so thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's yeah. what we do. And it's such an integral part of connecting with our clients in our stores, but also in the social media um, so we know it's important. We know we have to do it. We know we have to connect. We know people want to work, do business with people, all things that, again, I totally agree with, but it's so hard to find the time. Do you have any mm. tips or strategies on being more efficient with our time as we're trying to do all, <laughs> just, oh, yeah. do juggle all the things? Yes. Yeah. Aside from cloning, um, yeah. that's yeah. always my, you know, someday that will be a thing, but not today. Uh, yeah, for sure. We have tons of efficiencies that we talk about and recommend to clients all the time. I'll give you, uh, let's two or three or four, uh, what our top ones are. So I am a big fan of Trello and it's one of many project management platforms out there. Asana is another one. Mondays is another one. Um, but we use Trello for absolutely everything. Uh, so if you're not familiar with what Trello is, it could absolutely revol- revolutionize your work life. And I don't work for Trello. I don't get paid for tre- by Trello. I just am a big advocate. Uh, and I love it because it just helps you have everything in one central repository. So just that organizational efficiency is probably my number one recommendation. As far as social media and, in the, and getting down to the day-to-day, a couple of things. One is batching content. Uh, when we're recommending to clients that they sit down and do all their blogs in one sitting or do all the photos for one month in one shot, um, try to create some efficiencies around some of those tasks. Like for example, I have a client that converted a closet into a little studio and she just opens the door and she's got her studio lights in there. She's got a little mini stage. She just plops her product in there, shoots some shots, and then she's done. 
So some of that batching is, is another efficiency. Um, of course, pre-scheduling, take advantage of all the tools on these platforms to pre-schedule your posts so that you're not feeling like your hair's on fire all the time. Oh, I forgot to post on Instagram and oh, I'm behind on, on Facebook. Uh, Meta, uh, which is the parent company of Facebook and Instagram has a pre-scheduler, or you can use something like Hootsuite. Uh, there's, there's a pre-scheduler for everything out there. So again, in one sitting, take your whole monthly plan, plug in what those posts are, and then you're kind of one and done. Um, and then just make sure you have a calendar for scheduling, uh, the clients that don't seem to know what's coming up next. And they, they are a little bit scatterbrained as far as, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is a great tool for them. You can just use Excel or any kind of calendar tool. We use Excel for our clients. We dump in, you know, left-hand column, all the channels that we're covering. And then across the top dates by week this week, we're going to talk about these trunk shows or these new product launches or these classes that we're launching mm -hmm. and just dump it all onto one spreadsheet. Um, I find clients that are also that type that are solopreneurs, they're doing all the things and they're running the whole show. If you do have any employees or assistants, a calendar like that really helps everybody because then everybody's on the same page and you know exactly what's going out on your channels in any given month. So I'd say those four things, batching, pre-scheduling, Trello, and using a calendar are probably our top four efficiencies. Yeah. And it, it is so important. All great. So it's funny. I have a story about Trello. I try so oh. hard to be a Trello lover. I've okay. courses. I've done the things. I just can't do it, but it is interesting mm. because everybody else loves it. So mm. we do a sauna only because my team set it up. <laughs> we yeah. just do what I'm told sometimes at some right. point. Yeah, but, yeah. But I think any scheduling tool and Trello is very visually beautiful. So if you're a visual, yes. then I think it's really, uh, I, I hear that from my clients a lot. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that they love it because it's so visual. Yeah. And you're right. It's great. So we teach in the retail space to have promotional calendars done exactly the same thing. You know, what's coming up? What's the next thing? You know, Father's Day, whatever it is, graduation, what are we promoting in our stores? And I think, you know, if you just take the time to exactly what you just said, just sit down, spend a couple of hours mm -hmm. like brainstorming what's coming up in the next you know, next quarter, I'm a 90 day girl. I think everybody yeah. should be planning 90 days, yeah. out, especially with your content, you're, you know, already right. have your orders in your products yeah. are there, you know what you're talking, you know, you're making, creating or selling whatever it is, what's coming up. So it's so much easier to just sit down and do a big old brain dump over a coffee, like grab your coffee. I always say get a coffee and sit down and mm -hmm. just do it. Right. And then it's so much easier it's on the fly. It's never winging it. It's never I mean, mm -hmm. it's so a quick question on the, on the batching of the scheduling. So I use, I just see, we use meta planner. We use the planner inside meta, mm -hmm. behind meta, whatever it is. Yeah. What are the, what are your thoughts on using it, pushing it out like from Canva? I get asked that a lot or pushing it out from, you know, put, scheduling your, um, scheduling your social media through uh, well, like Canva. That's a question that's coming up a lot now that they're mm. expanding. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. Is it, are, are we being punished through Facebook <laughs> because we do these things? No, I, well, I don't know. I just sh should just say, I don't know, you know, Facebook changes so much and so right. often you just never, you, we don't know exactly how the algorithm works. So I don't know for sure about that, but you know, my response to that is always use what's intuitive to you and what you can do. If right. you're doing all your stuff in Canva and that's the most convenient place for you to do that, mm -hmm. then utilize that as a tool. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a variety of tools for a reason. Cause not every one thing fits every one person. I'm not aware of any penalization from using something like Hootsuite or a third party, uh, for Facebook or meta, uh, but that's not to say it wouldn't come down soon enough. Uh, but yeah, whatever I think is easy and accessible to you is the tool you should be using. Yeah. I also think, and I'm sure you'll agree is testing, right? Like just watch, right. watch numbers. I always say test, you know, test absolutely. And then try it out again. Can we just quickly talk about paid opportunities, paid, okay. paid social media, Facebook ads? What are, you know, are you recommending, suggesting, or when would we consider doing paid? Um, how do we see an ROI on that? Like, what are your thoughts on paid um, mm -hmm. advertising? Yeah. So we do have a lot of paid programs, uh, for paid. I'd say the most common things that we're seeing is entry level would be Facebook and Instagram advertising. 
Uh, we do have some clients that are qualified enough to do Pinterest. I think Pinterest is an often overlooked channel, especially if you're in a visual place. Uh, if you do Pinterest well, which may include paid ads, you can often get that to the top three of your referral traffic. So I always tell people don't overlook Pinterest. Uh, we have other clients that expand into Google ads, which honestly has not been as good a performer in that space. Uh, we'll also have clients that want to do programmatic, which would be like retargeting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you're, you know, shopping for something on a website and then you come into some other platform, you're at on CNN or whatever, and you see, oh my gosh, I was just looking at those shoes yeah. Yeah. that's retargeting. Yeah. Uh, so that would be falling under that programmatic area. And then geofencing is another one that some clients take advantage of. And geofencing would be if you're at, uh, let's say you're a local shop and you're near an event, if people have their location on, on their phones, the geofencing can target them and, and serve up ads to that audience. So we have some clients that, that have found some great results with that. Another one that a lot of people don't know about, which has been around for ages and ages, is custom audiences in Facebook. And that's if you've got a really nice, robust e-newsletter list, you can take that list and upload it into Facebook and either do an exclusionary or an inclusionary audience where you're advertising to those people. Only those people would see that ad or everybody except those people would see that ad. Uh, so sometimes that can be really effective too. And as far as overall, should you be spending money on, on uh, ads in general? Yeah, I'd say there's a time and a place for it. If you've got something that's really big for you, you know, if you've got some super special teacher coming in to do an exclusive weekend retreat and it's do or die and you've got to make this happen, yeah, throw some money at it. That's exactly the kind of opportunity where you'd want to take advantage of that extra bit of advertising. If you're doing best practices and you're doing all the things right, you should have a nice, robust, organic presence mm -hmm. on social and on your channels. So I love to see, you know, clients rely on all their organic first, but I'm not opposed to, to advertising. I've definitely seen some clients, especially with like the retargeting. Gosh, I had one client, he was spending a dollar and getting $7 ROI on that campaign. So you'll do that all day long, right? Spend a right. dollar and make seven. So it just depends on, on the situation and what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve. Right. And I think that's the key. You have to be measuring, watching and knowing what your goals mm -hmm. are. So I love that you said that. So geofencing, yeah. just um, just to highlight that. So because a lot of us, you know, we're, we're brick and mortar local, I'm seeing that working more and more for mm -hmm. people, especially during events, like you just said, or something, yeah. uh, special events. And that's working really well. Pinterest for the brick and mortar that don't have an e-commerce presence, I'm not seeing a great, mm -hmm. and I, maybe you can Maybe you can agree or disagree with me on that because it's driving traffic, but not necessarily foot traffic. It's, you know, driving yeah. traffic to websites, which is still, you know, you still want to be known in your community and all that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I always say we have to really pay attention to what it is your ultimate goal is as well. Right. So yeah. 10,000 followers on uh, Instagram that live and you don't have any commerce site to back that up is, you know. Uh, if you're trying to get your local foot traffic in. So just a, mm -hmm. just a, a heads up, because I know everybody heard yep. you say that and they're like, oh, I'm going to yeah. start Pinterest and, you yeah. to and whatever. But I, I love what you said at the beginning about really being, you know, paying attention to what you have the bandwidth for and yep. and what's your ultimate goal, like measuring. So like to what you just mm -hmm. said. So mm -hmm. and um, always go back to your customer avatar. You got to right. always yeah. align that back to who you're targeting. And like you just said, if you're a brick and mortar and you're not e-commerce, then that might not be your customer. You, you know, you don't want to spend all this time and energy trying to bring in uh, the West Coast customer. If yeah. you're a little shop on the East Coast, that's just a waste of your time and energy. Mm -hmm. So go back to your customer avatar and make sure that all of your goals and your marketing efforts are aligned with bringing that customer in the door. Yeah. I always say your idea, like, who do you want more of in your mm -hmm. shop? Like, who, who do we want more of? And we just, you know, how do we clone those people? Where are they? Like, they're friends, right? right? So yes, yeah, that's great. Um, I appreciate that. So anything else on the social media or maybe marketing side that you can <clears throat> share with us before we wrap up? Oh gosh. Other things. I mean, we, we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours on all the, <laughs> on all the things I'm, I'm just like, racking my brain of like, what are some things I, 
I hear, I would say, I don't know, maybe TikTok is another thing that people are talking a lot about lately. And aside from your political feelings about uh, the channel and all the stuff in the news, if you are somebody that's, you know, willing to consider that as a channel, I'm, I'm one that's advocating for taking a look at that. I think there's a lot of really effective results I'm seeing on TikTok. Um, I always tell people you don't have to be polished. You don't have to be professional. It doesn't have to be perfect. Again, it's just another channel to connect with your audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to bust the misconception that TikTok is for all the preteens and dance yeah. show. It is a smart algorithm and it knows, uh, you know, if I'm on TikTok, for example, it's serving up content that I want to see. It's all about topics that are related to me because it knows, you know, ab about me. And again, political stuff aside, maybe it knows too much about me. But I'm, I'm seeing that as a channel uh, that if you are interested and that aligns with your avatar to go ahead and, and put some short form video over on TikTok. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a an interesting thing to look at as well, too. It's working really well for some people, but you have to mm -hmm. and it's you're right. You can be so imperfect on it. I have a, a client who just you know, she just does really sh obviously really short, quick TikToks. She's not dancing or anything. She's yeah. just talking about her products really quick in a fun yeah. Awesome way, like behind the scenes kind of stuff. And it's just working like gangbusters. So it, yeah. it's again, what you, what you're comfortable yeah. doing. So one other thing to comment sold has been really, yeah. really popular for a lot of our uh, yeah. clients. If you're willing to go live on Facebook and, you know, other platforms like that, just live selling seems to be a super hot thing right now. And a lot of my retail clients are telling me, Oh, I, I figured it out. I took the leap. I, put comments sold on and I am just selling like gangbusters. So again, if that's not on your radar at all, it might be something to, to take a look at. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic additional revenue stream, which I'm always advocating for. And we're seeing great things. I've been partnering mm -hmm. with comments sold as well too, but mm -hmm. even just Facebook live, um, doing Facebook live sell mm -hmm. sales are working really well. It's mm -hmm. interesting on the live sale thing, just a note on that. And for your, for your information, just from what I see from my clients, during COVID, it was, you know, really big. And during the pandemic, it was everybody went live selling and then people came back into the stores. Yeah. And now there's like a hybrid thing happening, mm -hmm. sort of like almost coming back to a bit like piece and piece. So it's almost mm -hmm. like you know, that comment sold portion and mm -hmm. the, and the foot traffic. So it's mm -hmm. interesting. People are still shopping. People are still spending. Sometimes they just want to sit on the couch and do it. Yeah. <laughs> other, <laughs> other times they are going to come out into the stores because they want to touch and feel I yeah. feel like these two big markets right now. So even if you're not in an e-commerce position right now, having comments sold works really well to get in front of your audience. I, I totally, yeah. uh, a broader audience too, cause they're, you know, they're further right. away. So I think yeah. comments sold is a great, uh, great thing. Okay. Really quick question. I wasn't yeah. going to talk about this, but I'm now yeah. I'm going to like keep you, even though I told okay. you to be short, yeah. um, quick question. What are your thoughts on using chat GPT or is that too big of a topic? for social media. I'm not a chat, chat GPT expert, but I've been dabbling, but I'm curious because okay. it's coming. Okay. I'll give you the one second, the, the one minute response one, on chat, one... chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. Um, use chat GPT for ideation Yes. and not as a replacement for your messaging. Uh, we equate chat GPT with a ninth grader. So if you would run over to the you know high school and grab a ninth grader and put them in charge of all your social media, then maybe chat GPT is for you. There's a lot of mistakes that we're seeing come across. And I think more importantly, it's, it's very superficial. We're trying to go for differentiation. We want to tell people our stories, what's different about our brands. We want our voice to come through. None of that happens with ChatGPT. So use it to create outlines, to generate ideas, to brainstorm with your team, to come up with you know the top 10 list of video topics you can uh, explore, but not as a replacement for writing a whole blog, for example. You, you don't want to do that. Yeah. I, so I agree. I was like, oh, we didn't talk about this before. What is she going to say? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, I, I agree. And I'm glad I feel the same. I feel like it's a great idea, idealization or place to get ideas and prompts and like, you know, just right. to kind of stimulate some things, but I'm seeing a lot of false and wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a fact. It doesn't fact check or anything. So yeah. it's I'm glad you said that. I was just yeah. curious. I wanted to bring the topic up. I've actually had people ask me why I'm not doing a podcast on how to use ChatGPT in retail. I think there are things like getting um, 
uh, SEO content for your product description for your, you know, your yes. products and stuff. I think that like Shopify has a wonderful program that uses yep. AI because we use AI yeah. in a lot of things, but ChatGPT yeah. specifically. And uh, so I don't, I feel like there's too many people calling themselves ChatGPT experts now. Yeah. <laughs> telling right. people how to do I was like, I am not being that person. I'm just yeah. gathering ideas from lots of different guests. So how that, how's that for bringing it yeah. into the world? That's my two cents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to honor your time. I, I feel like we could talk forever. I have a million more questions, but I am going to wrap up. And as okay. we, we always end our podcast with rapid fire questions for- okay our guests, if that's okay, yeah. game. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. As an entrepreneur, were you born with it or did you learn to become one? Um, I would say I was born with it. My father was a, uh, a hustler on Coney Island, uh, working games of chance, yeah. uh, to put himself through college and then went on to create a successful physical therapy business in Western New York. My mother was always in corporate marketing in the early eighties, she was rising to the top of the echelon, um, the, the higher levels in corporate marketing. So, you know, I grew up with that. So I think it was just in my genes. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> <Sounds> like <laughs> it. So when you are not, uh, in your business and doing yeah. what you do really well in your business, what is a favorite hobby or thing that you like to do? Well, I'm lucky enough, like most people that are listening to your podcast to do what I love for a living. Like I mentioned earlier, I started with a passion for knitting. So that's still what I do in my quiet time. I'm lucky enough to have a little craft room where my sewing machine is set up all the time and I'll just pop in there and make, I'm a maker. So I constantly have to be making things, um, knitting, I spin, I just recently got into collage art. So anything where I can make, be creating something, making something, that's where I'm at. I've, I've got two awesome dogs too. I'm a big dog lover. So usually walking them or hiking with them or playing with them. So that's what I do. Oh, that's really cool. So collage art, that's really interesting. Is that a yeah. new, new thing for you? Or I'm It just is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I I don't know. Maybe it started because I felt like I wasn't very good at drawing or painting. And so collage is a great way to just cut up other people's art and rearrange it in a new way. Oh. Uh, and I think it's a lot like quilting too. I love that about quilting. You take beautiful fabric and cut it all up and reassemble it in a, in a new way that's pleasing. So I think those two things are in alignment with, you know, what I love about both of them, but yeah, I've been doing botanical collages where I kind of take old botanical images, cut them all up and then rearrange them kind of like a bouquet in a vase. So I've done about three or four pieces on that and, uh, yeah, really enjoying it. So fun to have a hobby. I, I have like a confession. So I was a creative first. Um, I guess I was always a business owner, but then create, I was really into creative and a painted painting furniture and all of that, yeah. all the time DIYing. That's, yeah. I live in an old crooked cottage that we're forever DIYing. Yeah. But I actually just recently took up rug hooking. So oh, I love that. Because yeah. I was missing a creative outlet yeah. of a smaller portion than mm -hmm. furniture and you're DIYing or whatever. So I am now obsessed and <laughs> have a lot of, I can see it. I am just uh -huh. back into rug hooking. Uh, That's yeah. amazing. It's Patrick, if uh, if you if I don't know if you know Deanne, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, it's just really funny because uh, it's fun to get back into that. It's, mm -hmm. I think it also makes us better business people when mm -hmm. we step away from what we're doing too, right? So, yeah. Yes, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah. Do you have any surprise hidden talents? Hidden yeah. talents. Well, one thing a lot of people don't know about me is uh, I I love everything Italian and I started studying the language in college. So right now I'm at about an intermediate level. Uh, I'm in my fifties now, so I've been keeping at it all this time and uh, love to just keep practicing my Italian and I've got language partners and I study it in my spare time and I love to get over there anytime I can. So okay. most people don't, don't know that about me that I, that I speak the language. That's pretty cool. I tried to learn yeah. Italian. I tried to learn Italian when we went to Italy I taught at a creative retreat in 2018 and 19 oh, awesome. <laughs> which was it was awesome and then the world fell apart but yeah <laughs> I tried to learn I tried to learn Italian and I'm going to tell you so hats off to you <laughs> so yeah I thought I was going to be that person but I was not so yeah uh, hats off. it's a, a beautiful language in a beautiful place so that's wonderful yeah. do you have last question do you have any recent or absolute favorite business books or podcasts that you mm can share with us and share sure, sure. Uh, a couple I recommend I, over and over again to, to clients. One is rocket fuel by Gino wow. Wickman, love his work. And the premise there is for people that <clears throat> are visionary 
you know, I find there's several types of people in a business. We're all, a lot of us are visionaries and we need an integrator. We need somebody to take all of our ideas and put them into, into action or tell us that we're absolutely crazy and it's not going to work out. That book, Rocket Fuel, tells you how to set those relationships up within your business. So I find myself recommending that one a lot. I love anything Mike Michalowicz. We talked about him earlier, Profit First. Yeah. Clockwork is a great book that he, that came out after Profit First. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got it on the yeah, shelf yeah, over yeah, there. I got them all. Um, I got them all yeah. Recommend that one a ton, uh, just about how to optimize systems within your business. I've got a lot of value out of that. Podcasts, uh, I would say I love Brene Brown and all the stuff she talks about around leadership. I just love her style and her philosophy. Uh, I love Glennon Doyle. I listen to the We Can Do Hard Things podcast. That's a uh, one on my short list of playlists. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to recommend, I am a big Harry Potter fan. And I know for the Harry Potter fans out there, there's been some controversy around J.K. Rowling. And I came across this podcast called The uh, Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which kind of unpacks all of that sort of cancel culture drama that was surrounding her in recent years. Uh, and I just, I found a lot of value out of it. I learned a lot from that podcast. So that would be my third recommendation. Wow. Thank you. Those are great recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Where sure. Can our listeners find you? Oh, uh, website is stitchcraftmarketing.com. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have a podcast called Business of Craft, which you can find on all the podcast channels. Uh, but the website will have a lot of resources that are free for your listeners. We've got a blog that we publish twice a month with lots of content pertaining specifically to the craft industry. Uh, and we have a newsletter they can sign up for. And then we also do office hours, which once a month you can come on. We're teaching a little 10, 15 minute topic. And then the rest of that hour is open for guests to ask any question that they have. So it's kind of like free consulting. And you find those dates and that Zoom login by signing up for our newsletter, uh, which again is at the website, stitchcraftmarketing.com. That's great, Leanne. And I will say, even for those of you listening that are non-creative crafts and creative, there's a lot of amazing resources. Even your podcast is great. I just love it. Thank you. Great. And your resources are good. So thank um, you. I'm excited. And Leanne and I have a chance to, we're connecting at H and H Americas. Um, we are in June. So that's yes. very exciting <laughs> to like yes. meet people off the podcast and the yes. two-dimensional Zoom screen. So I'm very excited. Right. About that. So uh, me too. Me too. Here, connect with me and we'll, or we'll connect up and I'm excited to meet you, Leanne. So me thank too, you Wendy. for your time. It's been wonderful. You thank too. You. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, that's it for this week's episode of the creative shop talk podcast. I'm so glad that you're here to join us this week. And I hope you found value in what we're sharing here. I want to remind you that our website has all of the show notes. You can find it at wendybatten.com slash podcast. Everything that you need to hear about today's podcast is there. Also an opportunity if you need to reach out to me. If I can support you in any way whatsoever, please feel free to reach out. So thanks for joining us. Please leave a review, subscribe if you can, and never miss an episode. We hope to see you back here again next week. Thanks, my friend. Have a great week.